Heavenly Father, you have expressed from the beginning of creation and certainly the gathering of your people going all the way back to your promise with Abraham that you desire a united people for your glory. We will look at this passage today, Father, and and ask that you would show us that great emphasis of unity in the church in Jerusalem and how you, in fact, have equipped us to live in the same way, to have a right love and a right watch care in the meeting of the needs of one another. Doing that not only for the peace here in this church and all your true churches that understand this call to unity, but as Kirk just prayed, Lord, to be a testimony to the community in which we live, that they might see the unity and the love that we share and be drawn to your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave it to us. I pray, Father, that we would see this historical text in all of its truth, pointing to the great work that Christ accomplished on the cross, that we might have unity with you and unity with one another. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to not only understand this, but even more importantly, for your glory, live it out, Father. We do not want to be hearers who do not do. We want to hear and do for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Are you well this morning? You sound a little quiet to me. I'm not quite sure. Maybe there's just a somber setting upon us right now. The Holy Spirit's come down, and you're so hungry you can't wait to hear. Maybe. I have a, I have a, uh, a Fourth of July sermon for you. It, we're in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. God ordained this. And you say, well, how is it a Fourth of July sermon? Well, it's Independence Day, and we celebrate freedom, Right? All i got to do is proclaim the gospel because the gospel is a message of freedom from sin. So this is, for those of you who say, why don't you ever do special holiday sermons, this is it. Acts chapter 6, we just happen to land right in the exact same spot. Isn't that amazing how God does that work? If you've been with us, we've been through the first five chapters of Acts. And we've actually hit a big milestone. Back in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the, the commission was made to the apostles, do you remember? To be witnesses in Jerusalem, and then Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And so when we get through chapter 5, we've actually seen the fulfillment of the apostles bringing the gospel, the Holy Spirit comes in, and the church is born in Jerusalem amongst Jews. Now as we pick up chapter 6 and we make our way through chapter 12, we're going to see the second part of that commission take place and be fulfilled. We're going to see the apostles and the message move out from Jerusalem into Judea and into Samaria. And then when we get to chapter 13 through the remainder of the book, we're going to see the ministry of the apostle Paul, who will then take the gospel all the way, how far? To the very ends of the earth. And so you've made it through the first part of the commission that that Christ gave in Acts 1 verse 8. But I, I hope that you have, I hope that you've, learned thus far that this book is far more than a a chronology of the historical movement from point A to point B of the gospel. If if that's all you know thus far, then I have failed in the preaching and teaching of this. Uh, This is a story primarily about the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ to bring unity between God and man and man to one another. And so as we continue to make our way through this, we're going to see the triumph of the gospel over all barriers, racial barriers, national barriers, and certainly here, religious barriers. And we're going to see the power of the gospel as we already have turn enemies into friends and strangers into brothers and sisters in Christ, in God's family. Now, we're living in a time where if you have even a little bit of your ear to the mainstream media, all we hear about is division and difference. That seems to be the laser focused. Black, white, male, female, privileged, not so privileged. What a refreshing message the gospel brings. What a refreshing message and power the gospel comes and says, listen, there is an opportunity for real unity, not political, not economic, but real unity through a crucified, risen Savior. Unity with God and unity with man. And here in chapter 6, Dr. Luke reveals the power of God to unify his church 
In fact, in the, in the blessings, I mean, we've been, we've been riding this incredible roller coaster of love, right, and community and having all things in common, and it seemed like the perfect church. Of course, we know it was not, and yet here we get to chapter 6, and now there's suddenly a, there's a bump in the road. We have a struggle between the Hellenistic Jews, those who were Greek-speaking, and the Hebrew Jews, those who were speaking Aramaic and, and living in Jerusalem as well. And what we'll see and what I, what I want us to see, this will not be new for you, but I do not believe that we can overemphasize this point. I want us to see this morning the radical importance of the local church being unified in Christ. That we have real biblical unity, not unity that we fabricated, but unity that brings peace and harmony within the church that enables us to go and spread the gospel in such a way that people are drawn in. And so I'd like us to see that this morning, the importance of it, that we might, we might on this great 4th of July, we might find ourselves striving for it as well, being an effective witness one to another and to the Cambrian Park community. And I'd like to do that by looking at the text in three ways. Number one, looking at the absence of unity. It's here and it's not good. Number two, the pursuit of unity. What are we supposed to do? How do we do it? And number three, the fruit of it. So the absence of unity the pursuit of unity and the fruit of unity. The theme of the sermon is this. Unity inside produces fruit on the outside. Unity inside the church produces fruit on the outside of the church. And that's what we want. I know, I know you want that. I know you do. I know you want Christ magnified in our midst and you want Christ magnified out there that we might see people saved and added to the family of God. Don't you? Don't you? I know you do. So let's look at the first one. Point number one, the absence of unity. Look at verse one with me. Verse one, Acts six. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And so Luke begins chapter six with a vague introduction. He says, in these days... When the disciples were increasing in numbers. Now, we don't know what these days exactly were. We do know this, that the book of Acts spans approximately 30 plus years, ending with the Apostle Paul, obviously, in Rome, heading on to Rome. But when we look at the, the, the chronological data throughout Acts and using the epistles, most Bible scholars think that this was relatively close to Pentecost, probably Pe- Pentecost plus five years or so, mid to late 30s. So if you're trying to get a, a timeline, we're still early in the church, but we're not talking about the week after Pentecost here. And Luke talks about the, the rapid growth in the church. And now most of you know that when anything grows rapidly, my brother, when he was young and he, he shot up at a very early age, he, he, his legs would hurt from growing pains. And he used to say, my eggs hurt. My eggs hurt. I'm like, what do you mean your eggs hurt? You don't have eggs. You have legs. Growing pains are a real part of the problem, and we see them here in the church as well. Look at the latter part of verse 1. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, the Hellenistic or the Greek-speaking Jews were those who were, who were part of the diaspora. The diaspora were those Jews that were taken away during the Babylonian captivity, for those of you who know your, your church history, and they were dispersed throughout the empire, but most of these Jews were probably dispersed around the Mediterranean, living in places where the Greek language was prominent, and they had made their way back at some point in time, after Ezra, after Nehemiah, or maybe during that time, back to the holy city, back to Jerusalem. And they had their own synagogues, um, they, they, they spoke Greek in the synagogues instead of Hebrew, and, and most Bible scholars believe that there were some differences between the, the, the worship services in the Greek-speaking as opposed to the Hebrew-speaking synagogues. Minor differences, but enough differences to cause a problem here, at least in the early church. And the problem that we find is that the Hellenistic widows were not receiving their daily distribution. They weren't getting what they needed in order to survive. Now, almost all the commentators say they don't believe this was done maliciously. It wasn't like the the Hebrew Jews are saying, let's let's put a stranglehold on those Hellenistic widows and not feed them. It's unlikely. Most believe that it was an administrative failure, that it wasn't getting to them not because they were being malicious or there was a, 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 a true barrier, but because there was a failure in administrating the daily distribution. But it was a division nonetheless. 
one group was, quote, complaining against another. And the complaint was over a benevolence need, right? The daily distribution was something that was given oftentimes in the morning um, to those who were in need, not just the widows, all those who were in need. Um, Now, in our cultural moment, we think, well, we have the government, and the government provides Social Security and Medicare and lots of other uh, social services to provide for people that are in need, or at least they attempt to in, in some way. For better or for worse, I'm not advocating it. Um, that wasn't the case in the first century Mediterranean culture. It was the responsibility of family and local communities to care for those in need. Not only that, in the Jewish culture, we know that the Old Testament, God speaks very clearly about widows and orphans. And he says, you better make sure you care for them because God cares for them. And so there was an emphasis here upon the right care for those who were marginalized, those who needed help. Uh, So this neglect of the Hellenistic widows was no small matter in the early church. And the apostles understood that, that it was bringing a disunity. And it wasn't a small matter either because there were likely uh, lots of Hellenistic widows living in Jerusalem at the time. You see, during the, those Jews who were out in the diaspora and the Mediterranean culture, oftentimes when they would get older, they would come back to Jerusalem, back to God's city so they could die in the city. Well, oftentimes the man would die first and then here's the, the widow, the female Hellenistic Jew in the city with no family because the family's still living in the foreign countries and therefore they needed lots and lots of help. Um, so the church wanted to care for their needs. The church wanted to be faithful to the Old Testament, um, and therefore they took this very, very seriously. Now Luke, we already know, he's testified to the radical communal nature of the church, right? We were told in Acts chapter 4 that they had all things in common, and there, were not, there, were not, there was not a single needy person among them. So we know that there was a model there in place to care for these widows, Hebrew widows and Hellenistic widows. And we also know from the horrible, horrific, terrifying story of Ananias and Sapphira, that money was being brought to the apostles, and the apostles were in charge of distributing those funds. And so what we have here, a legitimate charge now, is against the apostles for their neglect of distributing the funds necessary to feed these widows. It was a big deal in the church. Disunity is always, always, always a big deal in the church. Now in the Western church where we live more like free agents than we do interconnected, interdependent members of God's family, we're far more tolerant with disunity in the body of Christ. But being more tolerant of it now doesn't make it less grievous, and being more tolerant of it now does not make it impact our mission to the lost any more severe. The standard for unity in the church, according to the Bible, is the Trinity. You heard it read already in part, John 17, 21, Jesus prayed this to the Father, that they, the church, may all be one. How unified. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they, the church, may also be in us. And so there is no greater standard when you hear, when you read the word unity or Jesus praying for unity or Paul calling for unity in the Bible, there's no higher standard for unity than the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one from eternity past, forever and ever. You can't get closer. You can't get more united. In other words, when the Bible calls the church to live a unified life in Christ, loving one another, protecting one another, meeting the physical and the spiritual and the emotional needs of one another. We can, listen, we can never say as a church, that's too much, that's too intimate, that's too extreme, that's too sacrificial. How can we do that when the standard that's being used is the Trinity itself, the unity amongst the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? We can never say that can't be what God has in mind because it's exactly what God has in mind extreme unity. It's what God had in mind for the church in Jerusalem in the first century. They had all things in common. No one was lacking. And it's what God has in mind for the 21st century church in the Western world. You say, well, that was a different time, different context, different people. True, same principle, same theology applies to us today. 
In fact, Paul made this clear, Ephesians 4, 3. He said that we are to listen to this. This is us now. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. Your whole life in Christ, pursuing unity with God, unity in the body, and unity with the lost through the gospel of grace. And then he tells us why. Verse 4, that there is one body and one spirit. My beloved, in other words, we're to pursue unity because there's one body and there's one spirit. So if you're in Christ, you've been uni- unified in Christ to his body. If you're a member here at Cambrian Park Baptist Church, you are a member here. That's an objective reality. That is a truth claim. It's not something we feel. We feel like we're united. We feel like we're disunited. It is what God has done in Christ. And so, if we do not live in a united way, if we do not pursue unity, we're embracing a false reality. The term psychosis, in the secular sense, is someone in their heart and mind who have had a break with reality. They're not living, they're not thinking, they're not speaking in a manner that's congruent with what is real. My beloved, I was, this may shock you, I was born a man. I was born a male. I didn't, at some point in my life, identify as male. That's how God identified me. That's how God made me. That's how God makes every single child in the womb. If I live contrary to that, I'm experiencing a form of psychosis. I'm living contrary to what is real. In 1990, my wife and I got married. That's an objective reality. A covenant was made. So if I live in a manner contrary to being married to my wife, if I seek out an adulteress, if I have lust in my heart, I'm living a psychotic life. I'm breaking with reality. When my oldest son was conceived in Lori's womb, he was conceived as a human being from the moment of conception. So if at any point in time prior to his delivery or after I treated him as anything other than a human being, that's psychotic. That's a break with reality. My beloved, when you were saved by grace and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you were saved into the family of God. That is an objective reality. So for us to live, for you to live in any manner that's contrary to the unity of the body of Christ, that diminishes the unity of the body of Christ, that works against the unity, is a psychotic way of life. You're working against what is fundamentally, objectively true. Not because you chose it, but because Christ saved you and made you a part of his family. Amen? Oh, that's good news, by the way. That's really good news. To live in any way that contradicts the unity that we're called to in the body of Christ is to live contrary to the work of God, the will of God, the purpose of God, and the redemptive plan of God for the world. The the apostles and the early church got this. Disunity of any kind, it jeopardizes harmony within the church. And for them, I would say, number one, it, it jeopardizes the mission. It jeopardizes the mission of people being saved. So first, We see that absence in the body is always bad. Anytime you have an absence of unity in the body, it's contrary to the character and purpose of God's church. Are you still with me? No tired eyes yet. Come on, give me another 20 or 30 minutes. What did the apostles do about it? They had a problem. What did they do about it? What are we to do about it so that we don't live psychotic Christian lives? I don't want to live a psychotic Christian life. I don't want our church to be like that. You say, well, how's your church? Well, we're pretty crazy. You know, we're supposed to be unified in Christ, but we don't live like that. Well, that's not what's real. What's real is that we are unified in Christ, therefore we want to live like that. So point number two, the pursuit of unity. Look at verse two. What do the apostles do about it? And the twelve, that's the apostles, the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick up from a, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, if you know your New Testament at all, um, throughout much of church history, some people have latched on to Acts chapter 6 as a, a way of understanding and describing the deacon office. There are two ordained offices in the church. One is the office of pastor or elder, and the other one is the deacon office that we see clearly delineated in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
And although I think that this passage is helpful, I don't think Luke's intention was to establish the deacon office in the early church. I don't think that's why we have Acts chapter 6. Rather, I, I think his purpose is to reveal the importance, the radical importance of pursuing unity in the context of the body for the, for the harmony of the church and for the mission to the lost. And, and I think that one of the reasons it's here in this context, it's to show that the responsibility of unity is the churches. It's not just the apostles. It's not just the teachers. It's the entire churches. And so look at what the apostles did. The 12 summoned the full number of the disciples. So what did they do? They had, they had a members meeting. Do you know that? They, they called a members meeting. Who knows? Maybe they sent out a mass email. They distributed flyers. Hey, we're having a members meeting this afternoon in Solomon's Portico. Get over here. I have no idea how they did it, but they, they had a church-wide members meeting. What they do not do, and this is amazing, they do not defend themselves. Right? It, it's, it's likely their fault that the Hellenistic widows did not receive the daily distribution. They were in charge of the distribution of the funds. And now in their cultural moment, what would have made sense to them would have been say, hey, you know, this really wasn't our fault. We asked these other men to take care of it, and they failed. They don't do that. They, they swallow their pride. They call an entire church meeting, and they seek an immediate solution. Why? Unity is that important. Unity is that important. They weren't going to allow their pride to get in the way of God's church remaining united. So even though the struggle was with the Hellenistic Jews and the Hellenistic widows, they call the entire church in. Why? Well, we just established we're one body. When one person suffers, the whole body suffers. That's an objective truth. And so they call the entire church to see that there's now disunity and we must deal with it and we must deal with it quickly because it's like a cancer. And we've seen that here over the years. When disunity gets in and it reverberates throughout the body, my goodness, people start getting lopped off, right? Disunity is always bad for the church. So they gather the church together and they do something very, very interesting. They do not exercise their apostolic power. They don't perform a miracle and, and make food and money for the widows. They don't even exercise their apostolic authority in getting it done. They, they call upon the members. Now listen, this is so important for us. They call upon the members to meet the needs of the members. Do you see that? They call upon the members to meet the needs of the members. This is not because the apostles suddenly got lazy. They're like, you know, this has been a really hard five years. We've got to take a break. They weren't getting lazy, nor did they think that serving tables, that, by the way, that's a, that's a, that was a, an idiom to um, basically describe feeding someone or providing food or providing money to feed someone. It wasn't literally clearing plates as we think, serving tables. Um, it wasn't beneath them because they had already been doing it. Like that was part of their duties, they, and they saw it as such in the apostolic office. They call upon the church to meet the needs of the church. It's a family issue. So they call upon the family to meet the problem, to address the problem. Each member given specific talents to minister to and build up the church. They understood that. They believed that. The apostles had been given the primary responsibility of what? The latter part of verse 2, preaching the word of God. They reiterate that in verse 4. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We're going to devote ourselves to that, brothers and sisters in Christ. And you, they said to the Jerusalem church, you are going to use your gifts and talents to devote yourself to all the other ministries that need to be taken care of here. Most particularly in this case, to make sure those Hellenistic widows get fed. Now these verses have been abused by pastors for centuries. Pastors who will say, it is my responsibility to preach and my responsibility to teach and my responsibility to pray, so don't ask me to do all these menial labor tasks. All the, don't ask me to go and, and prune bushes. Don't ask me to come and work on your house or work on your car. Um, that's problematic, especially in the context of this passage because that's exactly what the apostles had been doing. They were already serving tables. In fact, most commentators believe that they just stopped serving the tables, distributing the money to the Hellenistic widows. The seven men picked to do that, and they continued to distribute the funds for the Hebrew widows. So they continued to serve tables in some capacity, very likely. Um, it was not beneath their job description. My beloved, there is no work that's beneath any Christian, ever. Certainly not the serving of widows, 
when God calls out one of the highest forms of worship. Um, they, they call on the church to find people to do it for two reasons. Number one, their ministry load couldn't handle it anymore. That was obvious. They could no longer do it and be faithful to the proclamation of the gospel and prayer. And number two, and I think even more importantly, there were others in the church who could, who were gifted, and I would argue probably could do it better. Why? Because they were gifted differently. Maybe the gift of administration. And so we see that here. Look at verse 3. The apostles say, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And so he says to the church, church, pick people you know who will do a really, really good job at this, who will handle this money really well. Make sure they have a good reputation. I mean, it's, it's money, right? And we know how money can cause us to sin. And so he gives some operating, they give operating parameters here. They must be filled with the Spirit. They must be wise. I mean, that, that makes sense to protect uh, not only to protect the money that's coming in, right, those are funds made as offerings, they're important, but to make sure that these men's hearts aren't led away by having access to such deep pockets. And so the church does what the apostles recommend. Look at verse 5. And what they, the apostles, said, it pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Iconor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Stephen and Philip are mentioned first, um, in part because we're going to hear a lot more about them in the next few weeks. Um, But what's interesting to note is all seven are Hellenistic Jews. They're all Greek names. You say, well, why, why would that be the case? Well, that makes sense. They'd be better fit to communicate with the Hellenistic Jews and these widows who were not getting the daily distribution, right? They'd be able to communicate. They'd be able to relate. They certainly had a vested interest. I imagine some of them might have been their own moms, right, who needed this daily distribution. And so the apostles prayed and laid their hands on them, and they appoint them, look at the latter part of verse 3, to this duty, this need, specifically, to distribute the funds to these widows who are without In other words, the the apostles and the church see at a very early stage in the development of the church, first few years, first five years, they see that the the characteristics of God's community, of God's family, is many hands, many hands, many worker bees using their gifts and talents as God has so decreed to promote unity in the church by meeting the needs of the members of the church. This is fantastic. This is not a late development in in the historical record of the life of the church. At a very early point in the history of the church, we see community, gifts and talents of the members being used to bless and meet the needs of the members. Sound pretty radical today, certainly in the Western culture. Paul makes it eminently clear, Ephesians 4 again, God gave, now listen to this, he said God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. So why does he list them first? Because they're so important? Not at all. Their purpose, their primary purpose, Ephesians 4.12, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, primary responsibility is to equip the saints for for the work of ministry. So what? Well, that word equip literally means to make perfect, right? Because you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. You've been gifted by the Holy Spirit. There's a ton of work to do. And so the teachers and the preachers are to minister that and get you working hard. Why? Because there's a ton of work. There are a ton of needs. Even in a church, even in a church our size, it would be impossible for the pastors to meet all the physical, spiritual, and emotional needs of every member of this church. No way. Make it 200, make it 1,000, make it 10,000. I don't know how they do it if the church doesn't do the work of the ministry. Not possible. Not possible. To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ Now listen to this, verse 13. How long do we do this? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Well, when will that happen in perfection when Christ comes again in glory? Until he comes and he hasn't yet, not of this minute, we have work to do. You have work to do. You have been equipped by God. You've been 
gifted by God, talents, experiences, resources to be used in meeting the needs of your brothers and sisters here in this church and certainly the church throughout the world. What a different model. What a different model from the model of most Western churches today. I mean, that, that's a different model, isn't it? If we, if we walked in and said, here, pastor, most churches, here's Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Is this how your church operates? So, no, not really. Most Western churches in the past several decades have adopted a, a, a corporate model, right? We have, we usually there's a senior pastor, he's a CEO, and then you have a, a board of directors, and that'll sometimes be elders, sometimes be deacons, and then we have experts who fill in particular mission roles, right, or roles that, for particular ministry roles. And they're people that we bring in. Sometimes we actually hire the experts with very little expectation of the body of Christ. Right? Come, make sure you come here on Sunday because it's the Lord's Day. And make sure you give lots of money because we've got to hire these experts to do the work of the ministry. But then you go and do whatever you need to do during the week. And that's our model. That does not match Acts. It does not match the Pauline epistles. And it doesn't work very well, my beloved. It doesn't work. We're not to be, we're not to have a, a group of gifted professionals, paid professionals, meeting the ministry needs of the body. The body, we are to be producers in the body, meeting the needs of the members of the body. We are to bring health and vitality, physical, spiritual, emotional, to the members of the body. That's how God made us, that's how God equipped us, that's how God put us together. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. You know, you're not here by chance. God brought you here, he placed you, he said, oh, that's an eye, that's a foot, that's a leg, that's an ear, I got two ears, good, you stay here. He made the body like that, that we might function as a whole, that we might be a community that has the gifts given by God to meet the needs of the members in the church. And that's exactly what happens here in our passage Right, they don't go and say, oh, you know, we, we need a financial expert. We need someone who's, who's done their work and can actually distribute these funds effectively. They go back, they go right to the church, and they find these men who were already gifted by God to do the work. They were already there. They were already there. This is God's design for the church, my beloved. Oh, my goodness. Now, listen, when, when, when we together use the gifts and talents God has given us to minister and meet the needs of those in the body, there'll be a supernatural unity here that takes place. One that brings incredible peace, incredible harmony, and, and presents a fantastic testimony to the world. That means whenever needs are expressed in the church, God says, I have equipped that church to meet that need. Otherwise, it'd be contrary to his word. Every need that we have in the church can be met by the church. Here in Acts, the needs of the widows, somebody had to communicate it. I'm sure they weren't quiet. They're hungry. Most people who are hungry are not quiet. I'm sure they said to, their, to the other Hellenistic Jews in the center, hey, we're not getting, we're not getting food. You know, and so someone, someone spoke up on their behalf. Someone was listening to that need, and someone advocated for them. I don't know how, but it got to the apostles. It got their attention. And then the apostles gathered the entire church because it was a family matter. And then seven men who are qualified, are identified from the body, not hired from the outside, not hired professionals, members fully equipped to meet the needs. And then the distribution, this, you think about, it was more than just seven, right? We're talking probably about hundreds if not thousands now growing in the church, certainly hundreds of widows. So there were people who had to gather the money, had to count the money, had to, had to keep a record of it, had to keep a record of the distribution. There was so much work here. And then above and beyond that, where'd the money come from? It had to come from the church. These were the offerings that we saw taking place in Acts chapter 4. In other words, this was a family need that was met by the family. A family need met by the family. You want a definition of community? That's not a bad one. The family meeting the needs of the family. Not the elders, not the pastors, not the paid professionals. This is the, this is the community that God has created. This is our unity in Christ that we might enjoy it rather than living psychotic lives. Now that means, my beloved, that we've got to stop thinking like Western Christians. It's all about me. I can go alone. 
It's all about me. I can go it alone. I profess Christ. I have my Bible. I have the Spirit. I'll go to church once a week for an hour and a half. It means that we must see the spiritual necessity of our participation in the body of Christ. You must see, if you want to live in a unified manner, that your spiritual well-being is tied to the church. Your spiritual well-being is tied to the body of Christ. And other spiritual well-being is tied to you in the body as well. Paul made this clear again, 1 Corinthians 12. Listen, we are to pursue unity so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Why? He says in verse 26, if one member suffers, finish it with me. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. My beloved, we are one. The question is, will we live like it? We are one. You're unified to one another in the bond of Christ. He's the head, we're the body. So we are united. It means for us that we have to be cognizant of one another's needs. Right? I mean, do you know? Do you, do you know your brothers and sisters well enough to know their needs? Have you, have you gotten to know them that you might know their needs? And when their needs come up, are you thinking, how can I help? How can I meet this need? What, what do I have? And you think, you know what? I don't have the gifts and talents, but boy, there's somebody who does. Maybe there are multiple people. Do you, do you meet that need or do you find someone who can meet the need and, and really work to pursue that type of unity? Um, it, it means, certainly, we've got to be transparent. I mean, we've got to be transparent. Right? How, if the widows had said nothing about missing the daily distribution, no one would have known that we had a problem and disunity in the church. They said something. Someone listened. My beloved, how, how can we know how to meet your needs if we don't know your needs? How can we? How can you use your gifts and talents bringing God glory by meeting the needs of your brothers and sisters if you don't know them? We must be transparent. It means, my beloved, that you must stop thinking like this. This is not sacred, by the way. I don't want to be a burden to anyone. That's not theologically sound. You are, we're to be what? We're to be our, to bear our brother's burdens. We cannot say, we don't want to think, I don't want to be needy. I don't want to be perceived as needy because I want to be strong in Christ. Newsflash, ready? All Christians are needy. All Christians are needy. No matter how long you've walked with the Lord or how strong you are in the faith. And one author, one author went so far as to say that one of the greatest gifts you can give the body is to be needy. To be needy. You say, well, that sounds so weird. That sounds so contrary to the Western mindset. Why would that be a great gift to present neediness to the body? Because by being needy, you will reveal how much you depend on others and how much others really do depend upon you too. When we are needy, by letting others into your neediness, you cultivate unity. By letting others come and help you, you cultivate unity. Not only will you encourage others to ask for help too, when they see you asking for help, but you will promote a unity and actually bless someone with the opportunity to use their gifts to, to love you. Right? What a great thing. I need help. Please, you have gifts. Use that. Love me. Glorify God. Now, this, may, this whole idea of neediness may sound violent to your Western ear because we, we want to be independent. We want to be self-sufficient. Right? And I'm not, maybe I need to put some, I'm not promoting irresponsibility. Right? I'm not, they will just like, yeah, we're going to be so needy, Pastor. You wait. You're going to get it. I'm not promoting laziness or a lack of accountability, but I would argue that recognizing and living out biblical neediness is essential for unity in the body of Christ. Recognizing and living out biblical neediness, because we are all needy, will be necessary if we want to have unity in the church. So pursuing a try harder, go it alone, I can handle it myself, Western, Cure is a disunifying agent. It's a disunifying agent. But when members of a local church, listen to how one author put it, when he says, we use 
our brokenness and our thirst to drive us to God in and through His community. When we do that, when we reject willpower as a solution and turn to the family of God instead of our our own strength, then he says unity will take place and fruit will be born. The church will find a a family love and a family care. And that, that makes sense. If you're from a healthy family, you know what that's like, right? I imagine that if you're from a healthy family, you've asked for things a lot, the things that you need, and they've asked for you. And as a family member, you help. Why? Because you love them. It's not complicated, right? You love them, and so you want to help them. When there's unity inside the church, my beloved, not only will there be peace and harmony, but this last verse here, and, and we'll close, tells us there'll be fruit on the outside. Fruit on the outside. So one, we've seen that the absence of unity is destructive. We don't want it. Number two, we see the pursuit of unity is good and extremely important for the health and well-being of the church. Last, last point, number three, I pray you're still with me, the fruit of unity. The fruit of unity. What will come from it? Well, any, any healthy family will promote unity and peace within the confines of their home. When, when parents are, in, are constantly arguing or fighting or they're not on the same page and how they're going to raise their children or spend their money, there's, there's a lack of unity in the home. When, when children are, are fighting amongst themselves, I mean, even as a kid, I remember fighting my brothers, thinking, man, my parents can't be happy about this. Of course they're not. No parent says, oh, please fight. You know, no one wants that. We want harmony within our children. When our children are being disobedient, there's disunity in the home. It's the same with the church, my beloved. If we want unity here, we want to, we want to pursue any unresolved issues in the church. We want to make sure we guard against there being any type of strife or disunity. Even small stuff, don't let it be there. You know, bring it out, um, address it, confess it, and be reconciled. Um, We also know when needs are not being met, when there are people in the church who are struggling physically or spiritually or emotionally, and there's disunity in the church, and and we know that. Um, But when the church pursues unity, when we resolve our differences quickly, and we actively try to know the needs and meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ, not only will there be harmony and peace, which is a great thing, because we love that, right? We, there's so much chaos in our life. How glorious to have harmony and peace in the body of Christ here at Cambrian Avenue. Amen? But there's something else here that I hope blows you away and gets you super excited about really pressing hard to pursue unity. According to this passage, the unity of the church has a decisive role in the gospel going out and people being saved. Unity in the church plays a decisive role in the gospel going out and people being saved. Where do I get that? Look at at verse 7 with me. Verse 7, and the word of God continues. So the strife has been taken care of. The word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. So with unity now reestablished inside the church, with members meeting the particular needs of the other members, Look what happens. One, the word of God continues to go forth. It increases, Luke uses that word, and many souls are being saved. In other words, now that there are seven men who are overseeing the daily distribution of the Hellenistic widows, the apostles are able to focus on the proclamation of the gospel and prayer. In other words, each member is doing his or her part in the body. Look at the result. It says the word of God continued to increase. How so? Well, remember, I told you chapter 6 through 12 is how it gets out, out of the walls of Jerusalem, into Judea, into Judea, into Samaria. It's moving beyond the walls of Jerusalem. In addition, it's increasing because not just the apostles are proclaiming the gospel. The members of the body are proclaiming the gospel too. And so it's increasing both geographically and in those who are proclaiming it. In other words, the effective ministry now inside the church, the unity in the church is producing and effective ministry outside the church. The church working as a family unit together is having an impact on the lost. And when there's disunity in the church, we know this. We've, we've been, for those of you who have been here for a while, we've had some disunity in the church over the years. You have to focus your time and your energies to resolve the problem. And that's right, you have to. You have to take care of it. Um, But when it's resolved, how glorious to take that same time and energy and put it back out onto the mission field where it belongs, where people will hear the gospel and by his grace be saved as each and every member does his part. So we want 
We want a church firing on all cylinders. We want very little disunity. We want very few disputes. We want needs met inside the church so that we can bear much fruit outside the church. We're told in verse 7, the number of disciples were being multiplied greatly. Multiplied greatly. So well, why is that? Well, God was obviously saving them. God, was, we even prayed this morning, God must do the saving work. But something happened inside the church. There was not only unity in the church, but there was this understanding that everybody played a role. That this reaching the lost, this taking the gospel to Judea and Samaria and the ends of it required the whole church. The whole church had to pray. The whole church had to work. The whole church had to use their gifts and talents. And that's what the supernatural power came from. It's not yours, it's God's. But God gives it to you to be exercised. And when we exercise it together, oh my goodness, my beloved. When, we, when this church, if we were to exercise the gifts and talents in the power of the gospel that we've been given to by God, unstoppable. Unstoppable. So we can't just gather at 9.30 and pray, oh God, do a work. We pray that, and then we engage in it. We participate as one body in one spirit bringing the gospel to the lost. And people, people will be saved. Disciples will be made. And you know what's so great? The family grows. Right? God, God likes big families. Imagine what that table is going to be like, right? When we're sitting at the wedding feast of the Lamb and we're all around. What kind of table is that? Is there going to be a table big enough? You mean looking down? It's going to go for, what, hundreds of miles? Looking down one end, the other? God wants to grow his family. And he does that through his church, through the community. And he will save some of the most unexpected people in your lives. You, you know who I'm talking about. There are people you think, oh, they'll never, they'll never believe. You never would have believed. You never would have believed. I don't care if you were raised in the church. Your, your earliest memories were in a gospel-preaching Bible-believing church, you never would have believed had God not made you alive. There's no one in your life that's further away from Christ than you were before you were saved. All right? Look at this, though. These unexpected people, they will, if we're living as a unified body, expressing our love for each other, meeting each other's needs, we're going to have, we're going to be a magnet. There's going to be this attractional force of the culture saying, what? What, what are, who are these people? They were all strangers. They didn't even know each other. And now they love each other and they care for each other and they meet needs in such a way that they are, they're the most intimate family I've ever seen. Look at verse 7. The word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly. And this is such an interesting footnote that Luke adds. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. They say, priest, aren't these the guys? that are trying to kill them and persecute them? Not all of them. Not all of them. Living in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem, there were literally thousands of priests from the Levitical line. Thousands of priests who were, listen, they were not being paid by the temple. That was supposed to be their employer, according to Mosaic Law. They were not getting paid. Not only that, they did not get along with the the priestly aristocracy of of the Sadducees. So they were at odds with them. So most of the priests living in that time that were not part of the temple worship they they did menial labor and most were very very poor they were a poor group of people so what happens here they hear the gospel of jesus christ they see this radical communal love within the body of christ and they decide that they're going to swap out their priestly robes and their priestly attire to adorn the priesthood of believers in the context of Jesus' church. Right? And they, they, they saw people having all things in common. They saw all the needs of those people being met. They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They turned, they repented, they believed. In fact, it says that. They became obedient to the faith. They said, enough with the, the, the priest of Levi. We're going to take on the royal attire of Jesus Christ. And they did, and they became obedient. And oh, what, what amazing Testimonies they must have been to that culture. What amazing witnesses they must have been. They were drawn in, my beloved, not just by the gospel. They were drawn in by the unity and the community that they saw in Jerusalem. They were drawn in like a magnet. One author put it like this. He said, as people with little in common in the world's eyes love each other as if they are closer than family, all heaven looks on with wonder at what the gospel has created even Levitical priests will look on with wonder 
at what the gospel has created. My beloved, Jesus Christ, as you know, he gave up his royal robes, his royal attire, to come down to earth and attach himself to his people, to his church. He dressed himself in our sins. We're told in Revelation 19 that he took on a priestly robe, what? Dipped in blood. And he did that by giving his life on the cross in our place. He did that to bring unity. You say, why is unity so important to God besides being a Trinitarian God that's perfectly unified? Because after the fall of man, there was no unity with God or amongst men. And so Christ gave his life to bring unity back between God and man and to bring unity in the context of man. Man to man, woman to woman. A unity and an intimacy that could not take place unless this high priest paid for our sins in full. A unity that cannot take place in your life, listen, it cannot take place in your life unless you are born again, unless you confess your sins and you turn from them, you receive that forgiveness and you become part of God's family. You can't enjoy the unity outside of the church. You can't enjoy salvation apart from Jesus Christ. And the good news of the cross is that every sinner can, through repentance and faith in Jesus, not only not only be completely absolved of your sins, which is a glorious thought, and not only receive the promise of eternal life, which is an equally glorious thought, but you can, you can take off your robes of self-sufficiency. You can take off your robes of radical individualism, and you can put on the robe of Jesus Christ and enter the family of God with all the attire that we have as sinners saved by grace. Humble sinners saved by grace in need of one another in need of one another. Like these poor priests in Jerusalem, you can can trade your robe for a better robe, and there's a much better robe. The robe that you were born with is not a good robe. The robe that you wear right now, going it on your own, not being needy, not telling people of your needs, that's not a good robe. Listen to the robes that you will adorn according to John's vision in Revelation 7. He says, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. That means, all. remember, all the barriers are have been defeated. God unifies a people for his glory. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed what? In white robes. Pure robes. And everybody in the family has one. Everybody in the family is wearing one. With branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits in the throne and to the Lamb. So this is the church of Christ, my beloved. Barriers are destroyed in the church of Christ. And true unity exists with God and with one another because of the sacrificial work of the Lamb. How glorious. How glorious. A unified church is a healthy church where every single member is not only expressing their needs but having their needs met through the various gifts and talents that God has given. Not in the passage, it's the physical needs, but it's physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional, right? We're to, we're to meet those needs one to another. What a glorious resource. Are you using the resource here, right? Are, are, you, are you actually receiving the help that you need, and are you being a good producer? Are you blessing others in the church that they might have their needs met to and experience the unity that comes um, I, I, for the harmony that we want here, for the, the beauty and the peace that we want here. Um, freeing us up. Doesn't it free us up to be better witnesses? Right? I mean, if we're meeting each other's struggles and, and there's great stability in our lives because we're blessing each other, aren't we freed up to go and know our neighbors and minister to them? Share the gospel with them? I think we are. I think we're in a much better place to fulfill the Great Commission, right? By being unified on the inside, we can bear much fruit on the outside. By God's grace, it's all by God's grace, a spirit-filled church working together as one body. And that is our objective reality. That's who we are. We are one in Christ. God's plan of redemption includes us, right? It includes the church. So um, I want to close by asking you, are you participating? Are you participating in cultivating unity here at Cambrian Park Baptist Church? 
And if your answer is, yeah, I'm participating because I'm not causing any problems, <laughs> right? I'm not making disunity, that's not a good answer. It's not what this text is about. Are you, are you actively pursuing and meeting the needs of brothers and sisters here? Are you getting to know people well enough so you can do that? Are you bringing your needs before the body? Say, ah, I need help. I'm a Christian. I am needy. I need help. Oh, my beloved, I, I have never met, in all my years here, I've never met a single person. I'm not going to help you. Not one person. And we've had some interesting people over the years here. It's amazing, this church, over the last 20 years, when needs are expressed, they are met in tremendous fashion. Sometimes in the tens of thousands of dollars for a church that doesn't have a lot of money. Amazing. Right? So if you are holding on to your needs because you want to be self-sufficient, I say this loving you're a fool. Bring the need to the church that we might bless you. And if you are not using your gifts and talents to bless others and meet their needs, then I say this in love, you're also a fool. Use the gifts and talents God gave you to minister to others. You'll make them very happy. And you will glorify God in the process. Amen? All right, let me, let me pray right now that we would be that church, that we would be a church truly unified um, for the harmony here and for the witness to the world. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we see this testimony of the church in Jerusalem. We, we know it was all you're doing. Certainly by the power of your Holy Spirit and you being pleased to redeem many. Um, I, I ask, Father, that we would not be, um, have any sense of hopelessness in the work to be done here. We, we live in a dark place. We live amongst people who not only do not believe in Christ but hate him many vehemently. Um, but we also know, Lord, that, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you saved us, and we were equally wretched. And therefore, there's not a single soul in our lives, there's not a, a priest, a, a Levitical priest out there that you cannot not redeem. You can. And so I ask, Lord, that you would give us the wisdom and understanding to love each other in such a radical way as the family of God, meeting each other's needs to such a degree that you would cultivate a Trinitarian unity here that Jesus' prayer in John 17 would actually be answered and that we would have that oneness in the spirit and oneness in the body that Christ prayed for. And then in that, Father, I pray that you would take us beyond these walls, take us into our mission fields, take us into this community and use the testimony of a unified church to save thousands, Lord, tens of thousands, do it in this church. Do it in every single church in this area. Every true church. Unify us to such a degree that the world sees us and they're drawn in. That They want to know Jesus. I pray you would do that, Father, that you would bless us like that, that we might see your power exercised and that you would do it for your own glory, for you are worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen.